Hey, sixth graders, welcome back. Mr. Drain here for another lesson. Today, we are going to talk about Jacob and Joseph. Make sure you have your workbook with you and a copy of the Holy Scriptures. We're going to read, continuing our read through of Genesis. Let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O Lord, our God, you alone are the most holy King and ruler of all nations. We pray to you, Lord, in the great expectation of receiving from you, O divine King, mercy, peace, justice, and all good things. Protect, O Lord, our King, our families, and the land of our birth. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> so, first, we're going to pick up where we left off and talk about Isaac, the son of the promise, the son of Abraham, who was nearly sacrificed on Mount Moriah. So, Isaac. Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, were unable to have children. Now, remember, in the ancient world, one of the most important things people could do was have children. Why? So that they could have an heir and their memory would continue on after their death. This is what the afterlife was for ancient Israelite people, to live on in your descendants. And so for a couple to not be able to have descendants meant that they would die forever at their death and not be able to live on, right? So Isaac, of course, being a good husband, prayed for his wife because she was sterile. And God heard Isaac's prayer and blessed Rebecca, and she became pregnant with twins. But even in her womb, these two twins, they fought and jostled with each other. So she prayed to God, who answered her prayer with a prophecy. And that prophecy is in Genesis chapter 25, verse 23. This prophecy to Rebecca is, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples are separating while still within you. But one will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So God told Rebecca that two nations or two peoples are separating in her womb. This was a prophecy that each of Rebecca and Isaac's twins will be a founder of a nation of people. And God says about those twins, those nations, that one will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger, right? Usually in the ancient world, the oldest child was the heir, and this is still true even today in many places and cultures. It's unusual for a younger child to be the heir of the family, right? Now, God always answers our prayers. Sometimes he answers with a no, and sometimes he says yes. Sometimes, too, he says wait. And other times, he gives us something completely different from what we prayed for. We could say here that God certainly answered Isaac's prayer for Rebecca by giving them children, but Isaac and Rebecca did not expect the results that they got. So let's together turn to page, uh, pages 118 page 118 through 120. We're going to read about these twins, Jacob and Esau. Now for this one, I'm going to read through the text together with you, and then we'll walk through the answers together. So we're working through pages 118 to 120. Jacob and Esau. Before they were born, the twins Jacob and Esau fought in their mother's womb. They continued to struggle with each other after they were born. Genesis chapter 25, verses 24 to 28, gives details about the birth of Jacob and Esau. When the time of her delivery came, there were twins in her womb. The first to emerge was reddish, and his whole body was like a hairy mantle. They named him Esau. Next, his brother came out, gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country. Whereas Jacob was a simple man who stayed among the tents. Isaac preferred Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah preferred Jacob. The name Esau means hairy, and the name Jacob means supplanter or holder of the heel. To supplant means to replace, and that's just what Jacob, Jacob would do to Esau. Notice that Isaac favored his firstborn son, Esau, while Rebekah favored Jacob, the younger son. God told Rebecca about her two sons, the older will serve the younger. This prophecy about the brother's relationship will ultimately come true. Jacob will take Esau's place, supplant him as his father's heir. The first story we learn about Esau and Jacob illustrates their different characters. 
We can see that Esau is more concerned with the here and now, while Jacob thinks of the future. Esau sells his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of stew. We read about this in Genesis chapter 25, verses 29 to 34. Once, when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, let me gulp down some of that red stuff. I am famished. That is why he was called Edom. Edom means red and is a variation of the name Esau. But Jacob replied, first, sell me your right as firstborn. Look, said Esau, I am on the point of dying. What good is the right as firstborn to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he sold Jacob his right as firstborn under oath. Jacob then gave him some bread and the lentil stew. And Esau ate, drank, got up, and went his way. So Esau treated his right as firstborn with disdain. Even though Esau sold his birthright to Jacob, it was unlikely that Isaac would go along with it. So Rebekah and Jacob plotted to trick Isaac into giving his blessing to Jacob instead of to Esau. We read this story in Genesis chapter 27, verses 5 through 10 and 15 through 17. Rebekah had been listening while Isaac was speaking to his son Esau. So when Esau went out into the open country to hunt some game for his father, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Listen, I heard your father tell your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare a dish for me to eat, that I may bless you with the Lord's approval before I die. Now, my son, obey me in what I'm about to order you. Go to the flock and get me two choice young goats, so that with these I might prepare a dish for your father in the way he likes. Then bring it to your father to eat, that he may bless you before he dies. Rebecca then took the best clothes of her older son Esau that she had in the house and gave them to her younger son Jacob to wear. And with the goat skin, she covered up his hands and the hairless part of his neck. Then she gave her son Jacob the dish and the bread she had prepared. Jacob brought his old blind father the food and pretended to be his brother Esau. Then he tricked Isaac into giving him his blessing and making him his heir. The plan worked, and Isaac gave his blessing to Jacob. The blessing Isaac gave to Jacob, disguised as Esau, took the following form from Genesis chapter 27, verses 27 to 29. Ah, the fragrance of my son is like the fragrance of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give to you of the dew of the heavens and of the fertility of the earth, abundance of grain and wine. May peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master of your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you, and blessed be those who bless you. After Esau discovered his brother's trickery, he became very upset. From this moment forward, Esau desired to kill his brother Jacob. And so Jacob fled his home and Esau's wrath and went to live with his uncle Laban. Number one, what was Jacob and Esau's relationship like even before they were born? They fought with each other. Number two, how does the book of Genesis describe their differences? Esau was a skillful hunter and outdoorsman, and Jacob was a simple man who stayed among the tents. What do the names Jacob and Esau mean? Jacob means supplanter, and Esau means hairy. Jacob would eventually replace or supplant Esau as his family's heir. Number four, which brother did Isaac favor? The older brother, Esau. And Rebekah favored number five, Jacob, the younger brother. Number six, how do we know that Esau was more concerned with the here and now rather than the big picture or the future? He gave away his birthright to his brother for a bowl of stew. And he said, what good is the right of the firstborn to me? He doesn't care about his inheritance. How did, number seven, how did Jacob and his mother plan to trick Isaac? Isaac would dress as Esau and bring his father some food and ask for his blessing. So he impersonated his brother. He took his person, impersonation. Number eight, after Jacob tricked his father, what did Isaac pray God would give to his heir? Well, Isaac prayed that God would give him sort of the fruit and the abundance of the earth and that peoples would serve him and nations bow to him, that he would be the Lord of his brothers and they would bow to him and that anyone who cursed him would be cursed and anyone who blessed him would be blessed. Number nine, Esau, after he was tricked, was very angry and wanted to kill Jacob. And so Jacob fled to live with his uncle. Now, for the sake of time, um, we'll skip a little bit. 
we'll just read the next couple of things. Genesis chapter 28, verses 12 to 14 says this. Jacob left Beersheba and went to Haran, and he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your descendants. And your descendants shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And by you and your descendants shall all the families of the earth bless themselves. Right. So as Jacob traveled to stay with his uncle Laban, he had this dream. And in this dream, God reaffirmed his promises to Abraham and renewed his covenant. But this time with Jacob as the inheritor of the promises. With Jacob, then, God's promises to Abraham seem to be coming to fulfillment. By the end of Jacob's story, he has 12 sons by several different mothers, each of whom would go on to be the founder of a great tribe of people named after him. And together, those sons, the 12 sons of Jacob, became known as the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, just as Abraham did not want Isaac to marry a Canaanite woman, Isaac did not want Jacob to marry a Canaanite woman for much the same reason. A Canaanite would worship false gods and likely persuade Jacob to do the same, and thus they would forfeit or give up the promises of God and the covenant. So Isaac sent Jacob to the same land and the same family that Rebekah came from, that of Rebekah's brother, Laban. There, Jacob would find his wife, but this did not happen easily. In fact, just as Jacob had tricked his brother and his father into gaining his family's inheritance, Jacob would himself end up getting tricked, okay? And if you want to read more about that, you can read the, the pages on pages 121 to 122. But for us, we're going to skip a little bit. <clears throat> I want to talk about prayer. Catechism of the Catholic Church says that prayer is the response of faith to the free promise of salvation, and also a response of love to the thirst of the only Son of God. We're going to learn about two different experiences of prayer in the light of everything we've been talking about. The story of Jacob wrestling with an angel, and also of God's remembering Rachel illustrate the battle of prayer that we all experience. The Catechism also describes prayer as a battle, and we see this description played out in the story of Rachel and in the story of Jacob, the night before he is to meet his brother Esau after 20 years. So what I want to do, uh, I need you to pause here and read through pages 124 and 125 and answer those questions. So read about how God remembers Rachel, Okay, read that yourself. I'll go over the answers. Okay, so pause here and read God remembers Rachel. Let's go over the answers to God remembers Rachel. So on page 125, number one, why was Rachel jealous of her sister? She was barren and she could not have any children, but her sister Leah gave birth to six sons. And how does scripture describe what happened between God and Rachel? Scripture says that God remembered Rachel, that he listened to her and made her fruitful. Number three, God won't forget us because he's our creator and our father. Now, number four, what does Psalm 49 say about God's forgetting us? Psalm 49 has really strong language here. It says, even if our own mothers were to forget us, God will not. God remembers us. If God does not forget us, number five, how do we make sense of God's remembering Rachel? He does not forget us, but we forget him, right? God has to draw us. Um, we run away from God, and so he draws us back to himself, right? Number six, what had to happen first before God remembered Rachel? Well, that's what we see in this story, that she needed to come to him and cry out to him in order for him to hear her. And number seven, the catechism describes prayer as a battle. 
who are we fighting? Whom are we fighting in this battle? Usually in the battle of prayer, we're fighting ourselves, our own weaknesses, our temptations, our failures, our distractions, our laziness, and also against the devil himself who wants to pull us away from God. And there's three things we should do, must do in order to win the battle of prayer. We have to humbly, humbly recognize that we cannot do it alone. We have to trust God to hear our prayers, and we have to persevere against all obstacles. Now let's go on to the next pages and read about this other mode of prayer, God remembering us and us fighting ourselves and also us battling with God through the story of Jacob wrestling with an angel. So page 127. After Jacob earns his pay in spotted sheep and goats from Laban's flock, God speaks to Jacob and tells him to return to the land of his ancestors, where he was born, in order to reclaim his inheritance from his brother Esau. Jacob gathered his wives, children, flock, and possessions and set out for the land of Canaan. Along the journey, Jacob grew frightened of what would happen when he met his brother again. The last time they had seen each other, Esau had wanted to kill Jacob. So the night before they were to meet, Jacob found himself alone and struggling with his feelings. Then a strange event occurs. An angel appeared before Jacob, and the two wrestled until dawn. We read this peculiar story in Genesis chapter 32, verses 25 to 29. Jacob was left there alone. Then a man wrestled with him until the break of dawn. When the man saw that he could not prevail over him, he struck Jacob's hip at its socket so that Jacob's socket was dislocated as he wrestled with him. The man said, then said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He answered, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be named Jacob, but Israel, because you have contended with divine and human beings and have prevailed. So in his distress, Jacob wrestles an angel of God to a draw, although he's wounded in the process. Because of this, the angel changes Jacob's name to Israel. And the name Israel means he who wrestles with God. Israel, of course, would become the name of the people that would grow from Jacob's 12 sons. So Jacob becomes this great nation. What happened that night? Did Jacob really wrestle with the angel? Perhaps. The greater truth of this story, however, is that it tells us about our experience of prayer. One way of understanding this story is that Jacob, in his fear, wrestled with God in prayer. Our prayer lives can sometimes be similar to Jacob's experience, right? Prayer is both a gift of grace and a determined response on our part. Prayer always presupposes effort. It's not easy, at least not at the start. The great figures of prayer of the Old Covenant before Christ, as well as the Mother of God, the saints, and he himself all teach us this, that prayer is a battle. Against whom? Against ourselves and against the wiles of the tempter, who does all he can to turn man away from prayer, away from union with God. We pray as we live because we live as we pray. If we do not want to act habitually according to the Spirit of Christ, neither can we pray habitually in his name. The spiritual battle of the Christian's new life is inseparable from the battle of prayer. The opportunity to pray to God is first and foremost a gift, but it also requires us to do something, to respond to him. The battle of prayer, then, is against our own weaknesses, temptations, failures, distractions, and laziness. It's also a battle against the work of the devil himself, and God wants us to bring this battle directly to him. To be successful in the battle of prayer, we must humbly recognize that we cannot do it alone. We must trust in God to hear our prayer. We must persevere against all obstacles. So what did God call Jacob to do after he had earned his pay? Jacob is called to return to the land of his ancestors and to reclaim his inheritance from his brother, Esau. Jacob's afraid of meeting his brother again because Esau wanted to kill Jacob, and that was 20 years ago. The night before Jacob was to meet his brother, Jacob is left alone, number three, struggling with his feelings, and he wrestled an angel to a draw. Yeah, that angel changes Jacob's name to Israel, which means he who wrestles with God. And indeed, this is the story of the Israelite nation, one who wrestles with themselves and with God for the rest of history. 
<clears throat> Number five, Jacob in his fear wrestled with God in prayer. Right. Okay, now let's move on and talk about Joseph. Joseph. We're now going to learn about Joseph, who is the 10th of the 12, the 10th son of Jacob. Now, God granted Joseph the ability to interpret dreams that told of future events. You might be tempted to think that this was always a great thing for Joseph, but as we'll learn, it often led to suffering and to difficult situations in his life. We all have dreams from time to time. Sometimes we remember them clearly, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes they make a lot of sense and we can learn from them. Other times they make little sense at all. St. Augustine taught about dreams and believed in the possibility of God's speaking to a person through his dreams. St. Thomas Aquinas suggested four causes of dreams, the physical disposition of the body, our surroundings, mental conditions, and supernatural causes such as God, angels, and demons. Modern science tends to suggest that dreams are a way that our brains order, make sense of, and store in memory all of the sensory input taken in while we are awake, which doesn't disagree with Aquinas or Augustine. But regardless of that, there's no doubt that in the Old Testament, Joseph was gifted with the interpretation of dreams, right? We should be careful with our own dreams, however. It's not likely that we are graced with the same gift as Joseph, so we probably should not refer to the interpretation of our own dreams when we are seeking answers. Let's look at page 130, and we'll read about how Joseph dreams of greatness. How Joseph dreams of greatness. And read this on your own, and I'll go through the answers. So read Joseph dreams of greatness. <clears throat> So number one, who was Joseph? Joseph was the 10th son born to Jacob. Number two, this is on page 131. What special item did Jacob give Joseph? Jacob gave Joseph an ornamented tunic or a beautiful coat, what we often call later the technicolor dream coat. What did Joseph's brothers feel about him? Well, they hated Joseph because they knew Jacob favored him because he gave their father bad reports about their work out in the fields. Number four, what did Joseph dream about himself and his family? Joseph dreamed that they would all one day bow to him and he would be Lord over them. He dreamed this in symbols of sheaves of wheat and the sun, moon, and stars all bowing to him. Number five, what did Joseph's brothers first plot against him and what did they end up doing instead? They plotted to kill him but instead, they stripped him of his coat and threw him into a dry well, a cistern. They sold him to traveling traders. And number six, where did Joseph end up at the end of this part of the story? He was sold to be a servant of an Egyptian official named Potiphar. Right. <clears throat> now we're going to skip a little bit. Uh, we're... If you want, of course, you can read how God blesses Joseph, but I want to talk about Joseph and his brothers. I want to pick up on this note. So skip ahead for this lesson. Skip ahead to pages 136 and 137, and we'll read through this together as we work toward a conclusion here. So Joseph and his brothers on page 136. All that Joseph predicted came true. There were seven years of abundant crops, followed by seven years of harsh famine throughout the land. Because of Joseph and his position of authority in Egypt, enough grain was stored during the seven years of abundance so that all of Egypt could survive and live well. Even those in the surrounding lands came to Egypt to buy grain during this difficult time. That included people from the land of Canaan, Joseph's brothers, whom he had not seen in many years. Along with their father, Israel, and the rest of the family, all of them had been suffering in Canaan and finally ran out of food. So they came, came to Egypt with what little they had to buy food from Joseph, although they did not know it was he because they thought he had died. He decided to test them to see if they learned anything over the years. And so on the brothers' second journey to Egypt for food, Joseph hid a silver cup in one of their bags. Then he accused them of stealing his cup. The brothers had no knowledge of the cup and proclaimed, 
If any of your servants is found to have a goblet, he shall die. And as for the rest of us, we shall become my Lord's slaves. Joseph ordered his guards to search their bags. And of course, they found the silver cup. Joseph had placed the cup in the bag of the youngest brother, Benjamin. Benjamin's mother was also Joseph's mother, Rachel, and he was favored by Israel. Joseph had Benjamin seized. The other brothers threw themselves at Joseph's feet and begged for mercy. Judah spoke up and asked if he could take his younger brother's place and bear his punishment instead. At this, Joseph knew his brothers had changed and were no longer the same men who had sold him into slavery many years before. The time had come for Joseph to reveal himself to his brothers. Weeping, Joseph sent away all of his servants so that only he and his brothers remained in the room. We read about Joseph's revelation in Genesis chapter 45, verses 3 to 8. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could give him no answer, so dumbfounded where they were at him. Come closer to me, Joseph told his brothers. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for having sold me here. It was really for the sake of saving lives that God sent me here ahead of you. The famine has been in the land for two years now, and for five more years, cultivation will yield no harvest. God, therefore, sent me on ahead of you to ensure for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives in an extraordinary deliverance. So it was not really you, but God who had me come here. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, Lord of all his household, and rule, o, ruler over the whole land of Egypt. Joseph revealed himself to his brothers through his tears. But despite the suffering he had endured because of them, Joseph felt no hard feelings toward them. He had forgiven them for what they had done. And he saw the events of his life, good and bad, from God's perspective. Joseph understood that God had sent him to Egypt and allowed him to endure the rejection, persecution, and suffering he faced so that he could save the lives of many, all of Egypt, and even his own family. Joseph had his entire family brought to Egypt, and Pharaoh gifted them with the best land in Egypt to settle in. There, Joseph's family, the people of Israel, would live throughout the rest of the famine and for centuries to come. Number one, what came true? That there were seven years of abundant crops, followed by seven years of harsh famine. Because of his position of authority in Egypt, Joseph oversaw the storage of enough grain so that Egypt could survive and even live well during the famine. Even the surrounding lands came to Egypt to buy food, which is how his brothers reconnect. Joseph met his brothers again after many years because they came to Egypt. They were starving, but they didn't immediately recognize Joseph. Joseph tested his brothers by planting a silver cup in the bag of the youngest brother, Benjamin, and accused him of stealing it. The other brothers begged for mercy, and Judah offered to bear the punishment in Benjamin's place. Number five, after Joseph revealed himself to his brothers, how do we know that he'd forgiven them? He told them not to be distressed or angry with themselves. Number six, how did Joseph understand the events of his life from God's perspective? Joseph understood that God had sent him to Egypt ultimately so that he could save the lives of many, his family and all of Egypt, and to bless him. Joseph's family at the end of the story came to Egypt and settled in the best land for centuries to come. What do we learn from all of this? And why bother talking about Joseph and these dreams and these prophecies, right? The Catechism tells us this, that in time, we can discover that God in his almighty providence can bring a good from the consequences of an evil, even a moral evil caused by his creatures. As Joseph said, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Joseph said to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive. From the greatest moral evil ever committed, the rejection and murder of God's only son, Jesus, caused by the sins of all men, God, by his grace that abounded all the more, brought the greatest of goods, the glorification of Christ and our redemption. But for all of that, evil itself can never become a good. God is able to bring good from evil, even evil actions that we commit. This never justifies, though, intentionally doing evil for an intended good purpose. The end or goal does not justify the means or the way we do it. But God, being all-powerful and all-knowing, can use evil 
once it's done, to make it into good. He can indeed bring about good from evil. The Catechism points out that God brought about the salvation of many people through the evil that was done to Joseph. And this makes Joseph a type or a figure of Jesus Christ. Typology is the study of how persons, places, things, or ideas earlier in salvation history foreshadow or point forward to persons, places, things, or ideas later in salvation history, right? Joseph is a type of Christ because Christ, like Christ, he was rejected by those whom he loved. He was also sold by those close to him. Jesus is sold into, Jesus is betrayed by Judas, right? Like Jesus, Joseph suffered because of the moral evil done to him, but out of that suffering, he's able to bring about the salvation of many people. The suffering and murder of Jesus is the greatest moral evil ever committed, but through it, Jesus saved the entire world from sin and death. All right, that's quite a lot for today. So let's close with prayer. This is the act of hope in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord God, I hope by your grace for the pardon of all my sins and afterlife here to gain eternal happiness because you have promised it who are infinitely powerful, faithful, kind, and merciful. In this hope, I intend to live and die. Amen. All right, sixth grade, take care. God bless. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.